It looks like we are currently live. This is like the internet of things. You never know if things are going to work, how they're going to work exactly, but we seem to be live at the moment. Hey, Faye. So happy to be here. I'm happier to be here because <laughs> Natalie just released this new book. Um, Woo! Yay! yay. <laughs> What people don't know is like, uh, you know, when you write a book, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, the cover and then the, the content is just, this is like sweat, blood and tears, everything that goes into a book. It's just unbelievable. It really is. And you don't realize that deeply until you go down the path. It's like, first you have this, what you think is a great idea and you don't realize how that's going to morph. And then it's finding the publisher which is a whole nother animal. I didn't have a literary agent through um, the, the professional generosity of Joe Pine, who is uh, half of the experience economy. Some people might be familiar with Pine and Gilmore, the experience economy. I had contacted them many years ago when I finished my dissertation because I, I cited them. We stayed in touch and it was Joe Pine who graciously gave me an introduction to Neil Mallett, who is a VP of editorial at Barrett Kohler, which is the publisher of the Creativity Leap. So yeah, so then you get a publisher lined up. That's the business of writing. That's the business of book publishing. And then there are so many types of editors. I had no idea. So to be at this day is like, <laughs> ah, so grateful. It's really nice. I'm happy. Yeah. I mean, this is a, I'm so grateful that we met through Stephen Shapiro. Give a huge yes. shout out to Stephen, who's so, yes. you know, generous with his introductions, and uh, and together we get to work on, you know, your speaker reel, which totally right. are, made me. I feel like when when it comes to writing and then reading a book as an audience member, that I was so much more, even more eager to read it because I've worked with you, uh, I, I met you, and you know, just on zoom these days, but it really, right. right. feels very intimate. I just feel like, wow, I, I want to know what Natalie has to say. And you have picked a topic that in a time like this, I feel like it's so, so timely. Yeah. And who would have thunk that, <laughs> um, <laughs> these would be the times we're in. And, and, you know, at first when March rolled around and we were all adapting to this new normal of COVID-19 having to deal with a lot of of financial insecurity and difficulties that that everyone is going through those uncertainties everything from literally being laid off to furloughs to just you know you and i are entrepreneurs so you know it's always risky business but yeah. you know now especially but you know you adapt you find your new rhythm and, and you keep it moving and then you know um we were seeing in sequence the, the public posting of um, police brutality among some police officers, not all, but police brutality um, uh, against African Americans. And then the tipping point was the murder of George Floyd. So then we have the social protest, the social justice protest. So when we talk about times like this, mm -hmm. I, I, I keep reminding my clients, I keep reminding my readers that days of uncertainty are actually designed for creativity. And the way I like to explain it is that uncertainty is a characteristic of complexity. And when you have a complex situation, you can't, there's no easy linear solution. So you can't solve it in a linear fashion. You need to navigate complexity with complexity and creativity is actually a complex system. Absolutely. And I feel that it just, it's something that we all need to learn and embrace. And I love what you said uh, in the book that creativity is a competency that is available and accessible to everyone, not just yes. the chosen few, not just the innovation club. Uh, right. What, what, do you, <laughs> yeah. what do you mean by that? And why do you think that the, you know, that clarity and uh, differentiation is so important? Yeah, not, thank you for that. Not just to the cool kids, right? <laughs> like I, um, I have a background in cultural anthropology and fashion. Um, I've done a ton of work in the design thinking and strategic design space. And I would kind of internally grit my teeth whenever I'd be uh, facilitating a session, leading clients or something. And, and I hear people say, well, I'm not a creative type. 
because I can't fill in the blank. I can't dance or sing or paint. And, you know, the challenge with, with thinking that creativity is only among the artists, A, um, that's not fair to artists. <laughs> uh, we just talked about how your mother is an incredibly talented painter. I mean, her work is right behind you, but it's not fair to put the burden of creativity, of, of our creative practice only on artists. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not beneficial to our society at large. So the way I like to define creativity, my attempt to democratize creativity is to define it as our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems. We, we've ended up ghettoizing creativity among artists because artists are really excellent at, they design space and time for the wonder. They don't poo poo it. They don't think it's, oh, that's superfluous stuff. They really realize you have to dream. You have to ask aud audacious big what if questions. You have to pause, right? And they also are incredibly rigorous. If you think of painters, if you think of jazz musicians, of of dancers at the top of their craft, it is sweaty, mm -hmm. uh, tedious, not sexy work. It's very solitary, right? That's the rigor. So artists are just do a better job at sitting with the discomfort of the rigor, right? But all of us have access to that, absolutely. Yeah, I can assure everyone who, you know, all of our lives uh, on the surface kind of tell a slightly different story in the past few years, my life has been, I, I feel very, very blessed. Uh, and I know luck and, and creativity are part of that for sure. But the documentary and podcasting yes. for six years, doing what I'm doing now on YouTube, yes. uh, like you said, people look at it and think, wow, I mean, this is what she has to do all day. But you are absolutely right. I mean, rigor and creativity have to coexist. Otherwise, yes. like nothing gets done, right? No. There no. is, people don't realize that like when I do tutorials on YouTube and just recently I came across, um, you know, it doesn't matter what I was doing, like OBS and, you know, live streaming, somehow my screen recording device would just kept failing, you know, three, oh. four times. So, and then it was very frustrating because I thought I recorded, you know, 15 minutes, time to edit, as you know, edit will take days and hours, whatever. Yep. And, and I kept having to go back to it. but. I think it's that belief that, okay, this is part of the process. You just yeah. have to bite it and, and then just keep moving forward. Well, your example right there is a wonderful point illustrating that creativity gives us permission, even though it, it, it feels arduous, it's hard, it's like, oh, I gotta go back to the drawing board, I gotta try this again, mm -hmm. but it gives us the permission to be experimental. And that's what we're not doing enough of in our organizations. And it's exactly what we need, that we need that more experimental mindset when we're thinking about how are we going to get through a global health pandemic? How are we going to really build equity in our society? It's about going back to the drawing board, allowing, I mean, when we're experimental, we also allow each other to make mistakes. I, 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 I published an article on Inc. recently about um, this time, exactly what you and I are talking about, and how um, the experimental aspect of creativity, if we build that more to our organizations, and we're doing this tough work mm -hmm. of equity and, and access, um, that also means we allow some grace to each other. We're going to not be perfect at this at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we have to give each of, we have to give each other in our society grace that we're going to fumble, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to say the wrong thing, we're not going to say it the right way, but we need to try in order to move forward and to change yeah. things. I'm so glad you're talking about organizations because I forgot to mention uh, from the beginning right now, people who are listening, watching this are basically half, half the people are uh, working in organizations and the other half uh, have taken the leap to establish a, a creative uh, endeavor or company of their own. But let's face it, I mean, still a lot of people are working in corporate America, are struggling because as I was reading the book in conversations with you, one thing I would love to probe and ask is there are a lot of people thinking, okay, that is the leader's job. And someone like yourself, you know, you go to organizations and you do coach and, and speak for and, and really mentor these leaders. Uh, but what if people are 
you know, who are senior managers or associates and who are thinking, oh, I'm, I need to wait for someone else to read the book, to understand and implement it. Um, how, how do you kind of, uh, you know, help them understand the power that they have within? What right. Do do about the situation. Yeah. So it's like power that they have within both within themselves and their ability to start shifting their mindsets and also power within the organization. So I always say um, culture change, which takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight. But culture change, it starts with a shift in mindset, which leads to shifts in behaviors, which then finally leads to culture change. And our brains, our minds are incredibly elastic. And I mean that in that kind of chemical way versus plasticity. Plasticity is like it can't stretch or move. But um, our, our neural synapses have the capacity to reroute, to rewire if we cultivate different habits. So one thing I would say to individual leaders, especially at the top of the organization, is to adopt a creativity competency to start ex exploring creativity leaps so that you can acquire what, what Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset, right? Creativity is a, is a key way into that. But also ask for help. You know, sometimes we have this faux uh, vision that a leader is this stalwart uh, person who has the answer to everything. No, I mean, I, I recently, um, Simon Sinek uh, had a great interview in Inc. this week and I posted his interview where he was saying, one of the things leaders can do right now is to ask for help, is ask, is, is, is ask better questions, which segues into you know, what I call the three eyes of creativity, which are inquiry, improvisation, and intuition. That inquiry is curiosity. So being able to kind of step outside of oneself and ask a different question at this gnarly problem, but broadly, more broadly in the organization, there are emergent leaders, right? So there are leaders who can be found on the margins, who if you are at a huge company that has call centers or it's a fast food restaurant, it's the people who are interacting with, with us schmucks, the consumers every day. Um, and it's also the newer people who are on the margins, they might be new to the organization, who might come in with all this other knowledge from their experience. So it's about also valuing emergent leaders. And the only way leaders at the top learn that is they get out of the office, they walk the floor, and there's a lot of, lot, lot of models for leading by walking through the, through, the, mm. through the building, but getting out of the office, getting out of the building, asking different questions is a, is a real way to, to build leadership for creativity. Mm -hmm. I've seen there are a lot of videos as I was going through assets on your whole footage from the past, you know, five years or more. I noticed like something that it just shows me that will be something more effective and more adaptive, which is you don't just sit there and coach leaders and C-level folks only, but I've seen a variety of people among your audience, including very young people, you know, look, yes. they look to be college students as well as, you know, there are people who are more senior and there are people in the middle. And you've done these very collaborative workshops where people are experimenting, you know, thinking on their own as well as thinking groups and teams. Um, what did you learn or like observed from people who were actually working together? Were they shocked to be like, oh my God, now we have this opportunity. We never thought it was possible. Yeah, it's so interesting because as you point out, when I work with university level students, whether they're undergrads or graduate students, um, because as you know, Faye, I, a big chapter of my life, I, I spent with students, I was a professor for 16 years. And what I love about working with, with I would just not, not even just students, but when we allow ourselves to be, not, I meant to say, not even just people who are students formally, but when we allow ourselves to be in a student mode, there's something that unlocks in our minds. It's almost like, we're, okay, I'm a student, so I, I allow myself the permission to to let go of a lot of my assumptions mm -hmm. by the time we get young people at the university stage so there's still a lot to unteach you know sir ken robinson in the uk he's a, is a he's one of the foremost thought leaders about creativity the future of learning education and he references all these cases and studies where you know you talk to a bunch of kindergartners you ask how many of you want to be artists everyone's hand shut, shut, shut up, right? I want to be an, I want to be a dancer. I want to be in a rock band, right? Um, middle school, 
yes. about half have sloughed off. High school, it's like the weirdo kids in the back who oh, no. are the art, yeah. right? It's really bad. And um, and again, that's the assumption that creativity is only in, in the arts, right? But um, what I found, especially when I was teaching mainly, is that um, asking questions wasn't acknowledged as a way of thinking, which is what Warren Berger likes to say, right? He's the author of A More Beautiful Question. But asking questions is a way of thinking. It's not, yes, it's a sign of ignorance. Okay, I don't know something, so I asked a question. So what, right? As when I'm coaching and, and consulting with um, full-fledged adults who've been in corporate America for some time, who've been working some time, it's, it's, it's a combination of things. It's this relief that, oh, I don't have to know the answer. Oh, it's all about process. This is about play, right? There's a relief there. Um, at the same time, there's, there's also a fear of like, but will this really get to the serious stuff? Yes, it will. Because um, creativity is a productivity play. Um, I had, a, I had a, a great conversation on a podcast with a woman named Jen DeVore. Jen is with the Economy League of Philadelphia. And she said something that was so on point. She said, you know, 10 years ago, we were told that if your company is in a tech company, then you really should be in the tech business. And she said, today, it seems like you really should be in the creativity business. And I was like, I love that. That's, that's so spot on. And you really should be in the creativity business today because of the way it helps our minds to work in a much more elastic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I really love the idea that you don't have to be in a, in a certain title. You don't have to... Uh, be seen a certain way and somehow that just what you said reminded me of literally two people one developer one designer at my older company Arnold and they just got together and said you know we have this new office space and together with one designer one developer they made an interactive seating chart and I remember that huh. nobody asked them to do that and, right um, as a project manager I actually wanted to make sure they had enough time carved out for this wasn't very much time at all maybe 10 20 percent and this tool becomes something that not only everybody used but becomes what they were known for um, yes so i think i think like you said there is an opportunity for people even if they're not given the title even if their leaders may or may not believe in this or read the book but there is still power within themselves that they can take advantage of right yeah, there's, there's two things um, that you said there that I want to just touch on. First is you said it was a coder and a designer, right? Yeah, who, yeah. Who got together. So what I love about that example, it reminds me when I worked in the fashion industry and global sourcing, uh, I, I, for a short period of time, I lived and worked in Sri Lanka and in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I was really up close um, in, the, in the mills. The, the knitting mills, the weaving mills, is, well, in underwear, I was selling bras and panties. I saw Victoria's Secret. Secret, yeah. Right. Uh, but in the knitting mills and the factories, that's where the incredible uh, stickiness and creative abrasion would come when designers would start talking with the yarn engineers about a different twist of the yarn to, to accomplish a certain hand and feel of the fabric. And um, the only way way they typically would have those conversations was when they could be in person and just kind of be walking the floor being very experimental so yeah the 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 what's called the the cognitive diversity the creative abrasion that comes from people who um you know are just playing around with ideas is really important and the other thing that you said which i thought was 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 uh, interesting here in this example you said they didn't have a lot of time yeah. and a lot of, often when I'm working with clients, they'll say, oh, you know, we don't have a ton of time or we don't have um, a lot of money or we don't have all the right talent in place. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? Creativity loves constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, creativity loves constraints Absolutely. on time. It loves constraints on budget. It loves constraints on people talent. Uh, we all have been in situations, I think, where we realize when we are down to the wire, when it's this bottleneck process or even the process of writing this book there was so much that was marinating in my mind and my head like the writing part was almost like just 20 percent of it mm -hmm. uh so 
it's a beautiful thing sometimes when, when we have to use time as a constraint. I love where you're going with this because it triggers something that you and I talked even before we hit the record button. I said, can we take this opportunity and talk about people of color and how creativity plays in, in their, you know, as a role in their lives. And, and then earlier this morning, I thought, I think immigrants and people of color in general, and, you know, to add on top of that, people who are, who are not as, you know, financially strong uh, or in a, financial more superior position tend to be more creative because trust me i've been i've had the most fun going to some of my friends home parties and they're not financial advisors they don't they're not hedge fund managers yet the parents have done such creative work <laughs> when it comes to the party it's the most fun. it's not the most you know fantastic extravagant food or decor it just it was awesome. Everybody's so yes. chill, relaxed. I'm blown away. Like pool parties. Yes. Um, you know, people don't realize that. They, they could be like, oh, we're, uh, people call themselves, I'm blue collar. I go, I do a very mundane type of job. You go to their party, you'd be like, wow. I Absolutely. See right Absolutely. I, um, so gosh, so much from that statement, <laughs> the observation. Yes, it is absolutely related to this idea that, that creativity loves constraints. Often, when we are limited on resources, we have to, and I'm a big fan of this phrase, but we have to think out of the box. You know, <laughs> the dancer Twyla Tharp uh, famously wrote, before you can think out of a box, you have to start with the box. And I love that because, like, she's pointing out the rigor and the constraints you need. But, you know, and one example I shared in the book, and then a personal example, I talked about how in the 1980s, we were seeing some of the most drastically, um, it was a drastic touch point in American society of withdrawal of funding of arts education. Mm -hmm. And this was significantly adversely affecting urban public schools, which happened to uh, be schooling a lot of black American children. Interestingly, as music education inside the classroom was drying up, what did you start to see emerge as this really incredibly improvisational instrument? The turntable, right? In the middle of the, of the it was, it was we, were, we were on the crest of the rise of rap music in the early 80s, and all of a sudden, you know, these young brothers had turned the turntable and the, and the needle scratching a sound into yeah. a percussion instrument, right? So what, another example, of creativity coming about because of, of constrained resources. In a personal example, um, I grew up in Philly. My parents owned, my mom, my, my dad passed away, but my, my mom's still there in, in a two-story duplex. So it was two apartments. So I grew up in a two-bedroom apartment. I didn't have my own bedroom until I was a sophomore in college. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I had all this room to myself. But growing up, um, you know, my sister and I, had to share space, we had to learn to negotiate, we had to learn time management, all these things in a, in a small amount of space. And I marvel now when I look at what my mom did, as she was, she was an interior designer, she, she did space design. Like I'm, I'm amazed when I go back home now and, and you know, she uses that room for a completely, in a completely different way now, it's her music room, but the space that she created for us to to rest mm -hmm. to read to study to carve out our our own creativity was was just amazing so so yeah i, I love that observation yeah i i love you sharing that that story i did not read from the book uh, no i didn't i didn't include that one no yeah yeah that's that's absolutely lovely having your own space and uh we're, I mean, the, the space that we're living in now, um, you know, Natalie, you're, you're used to being on, you know, these keynote stages and now you're making just as much impact, you know, through live streaming, which what we're doing and you have this whole series of events, you know, one involved, you know, Seth Godin uh, very soon and, you know, last night with King and, you know, it just, that is just an amazing endeavor because I know that to actually talk to us about did you feel any sense of uh, friction or discomfort when you have to shift your platform? And trust me when I say, oh my God, I'm learning a whole lot every single day and I'm trying to teach everything I know about live streaming and, and, and Zoom. This is not trivial stuff. A lot of people think it should be really straightforward. How has no. it been for you? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, if people are not already subscribed to your YouTube channel, Faye, I mean, you are a teacher. You really do break things down. I mean, you, you've you taught me a ton just um, in the short span of time that we've been working together. So um, kudos to you because it does require a lot of rigor and a lot of patience. Um, for me, I will say that when March rolled around and we realized that we were having to shift into a different type of, of work that my keynote requests were shifting to be much more virtual keynotes. The first thing I did actually is I went into a complete mode of sharing and giving. Mm -hmm. So I just started doing all these free collaborative Zooms. And um, I remember the first collaboration I did was with my buddy Christopher Plant who is also an entrepreneur. He's the founder of Kismet Cowork in Philly and Radio Kismet. And I called him up and I was like, hey, Christopher, I think I want to just start sharing out ideas about creativity and design thinking. And would you help me? Because he's, he's really like a genius producer uh, dude. And um, he's like, sure, let's, let's try it. And I remember sending out stuff on LinkedIn, stuff on Twitter. I mean, I don't have a huge following on Instagram and Twitter is modest and LinkedIn is better. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping that we would have 20 people who would register and then maybe a dozen people would show up. Mm -hmm. And we had maybe like 198 people who registered, 150 people who showed up. We were totally fumbling around in the technology. We had to be super apologetic. We weren't sure where everything had gone when we saved it to the cloud at first. But yeah. what was constant is we had a sense of humor about ourselves. We had this willingness to just try. So what has shifted for me, like the, the silver lining, the blessing in disguise during this challenging time is that um, I just get to share my ideas differently. I get to learn something. I'm, I'm able to collaborate. Like this collaboration with you right now is awesome. I'm able to collaborate with people in a much more experimental and expansive way. Uh, what Christopher and I learned, we did, we did two together. I did one later with Ingo Ralph, who has this really cool project called The School of the Coming. I did stuff with Stillcase. I did stuff with uh, social impact investing groups. Just a diverse range of entities to explore these ideas about strategic uh, foresight and scenario planning and creativity. Um, this book launch would have been way more tame if we weren't in COVID-19. Like what I plan to do was fine, but I would not have had the opportunity to talk with John Maeda last week. You said Seth Godin later this week, Galit Ariel this morning, you right now, tonight with King Britt. It was going to be a fun book lunch party. I, I was going to rent out the um, the rooftop of the Free Library in Philadelphia because I'm a, I'm a geek girl. I'm a, I'm a nerdy girl. I, growing up, I love the libraries. I, the library is very close to my heart. Um, and we were going to have a DJ and celebrate, right? Yeah. And that would have been fun. But like now I'm learning stuff. I'm talking to a, a wide range of people. And, um, you know, net net, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. And it, it, I think it's important to stay flexible right and that is such a important message to uh, especially people who travel for a living you know speakers and coaches and i remember you know it hit everybody including me uh, you know i work with a lot of speakers and consultants and i remember that challenging time where to be honest like my work hasn't really changed very much i've always worked from home i am not a platform speaker at all but i saw this drastic shift for everybody else involved and I saw that everybody's grasping onto something to say, how do I replace that income with something net new? And I saw a, a very, a very much lack of uh, patience. And I, I understand people want to replace that income. And, and therefore, as a result, uh, you know, some people I have encountered and I really just I love them. I adore them dearly. They are trying to find a way to, again, just make money right away. And there is that gap and you talk about gap and patience all the time like how would yes. you you know as a coach as as a speaker to say to say to them like what how do you how do we shift their mindset to say maybe that's not how it works and this is what you have to prepare yourself for and still today yeah. great question and um it actually ties in really nicely with wonder and rigor it's it's something i have posted on my website a pdf about 
the value of the pause. Mm -hmm. So one of the elements of wonder is pausing. And it's about being able to appreciate awe. One of the challenges I also have heard from, from people and clients, uh, they, mm -hmm. in addition to the impatience, is like, oh, this feels like Groundhog Day every day. Well, mm -hmm. that's because we have to redesign our relationship with time, right? We have to have new rituals. We have to figure out new markers that mark our morning, our afternoon, our evening. I personally, um, actually through the, the encouragement and I, I've been learning a lot, I'm gonna be launching um, an online course on creativity in, in a couple of months, mm -hmm. maybe a month, we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. And I've been learning from uh, a dynamo young woman named Danielle Leslie, who teaches um, development of online, online courses. And she encouraged us to create a morning ritual and patting myself on the back, I, I've actually been, I've stuck to my ritual for about six weeks now. And my ritual requires that I get to sleep by 10. Mm -hmm. um, I wake up at six, I really rest. Mm -hmm. I get eight hours of sleep. I don't allow myself to hit snooze. And between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. every morning, I do my ablutions, my hygiene, I um, get dressed. I pray, I journal, I um, do some meditations, and I stretch my body. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I studied dance for many years, so as I age, I just really want to make sure that I remain, like, I think there's a connection between remaining flexible in your body and flexibility in the mind, right? Yeah. So, but this new ritual, A, I feel like a tiny bit of success every morning because I, I, I kept a promise to myself mm -hmm. and I believe there's a, there's a, tr there's a transposition, there's a translation that happens when we, in these times of change are just willing to design new rituals to help our minds to shift. So one thing I would really recommend to people is you've got to, whatever the ritual is for you, mm -hmm. you've got to design a new ritual that helps you to take stock of the present. So it's the value of the pause is about three R's. It's about first restoring. That's kind of taking stock of present state. And when you restore, sometimes you got to throw stuff away. <laughs> you have to edit, you have to slough off. The second R is to reorient. It's, it's, it's thinking about what's that future state that I want to be in and make it ginormously aspirational because you can always edit off later. Mm -hmm. And the third, are is to reboot. You've got to prioritize and figure out what's the first thing I'm going to do, what's the next thing I'm going to do. So that's that's what I have been helping a lot of people work through. Mm, I think I can use some of that help and some of that clarity. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like one of my personal struggles I've been thinking uh, about a lot is I, you know, th these days there are a lot of like these uh, uh, virtual uh, workshops popping up and I really appreciate what they're doing a group of people I, I did it for the first time it's a uh, cave day I'm interviewing the founder Jake very soon um, you know it's a it's a ginormous workshop 100 people then there's somebody who is timing it so you have these 45 minute sprints and then you do yoga poses together people love it and you be told I know exactly I'm like at the beginning I was like huh that's yeah totally fake and yeah <laughs> This is like, really? People really love that? And um, to be honest, I would enjoy that maybe once a month. I don't need it every single day because I think both of us have a lot of rigor in, in our style. Uh, but yes. I think I, you know, I think on the, on the other side of the, the spectrum, I think at times that I work a little bit too much, too hard, or that I don't have that reboot state really clearly defined and i'm energized by my work i love what i do so so much and it's incredibly difficult to pull myself away from it away yeah i i well i have to tell you um because i love netflix tv has never been better but <laughs> to pull myself away and make myself dim the lights turn it down it's 9 15 it's going to 9 30 like it's making a, a difference in my mindset and again it's I'm, a, I'm realizing i'm reading a bit more on neuroscience of the brain and the value of rest and sleep like this thing in our noggins this organ yeah. it is so 
it uses so much energy. It needs so much energy. Like the role of rest is important. The other thing I do, which I used to be shy about saying this out loud, but I think I, I'm, I think I said it in the book. I definitely been saying it in a lot of interviews is that I actually, <laughs> I time daydream breaks. So I make sure that I have at least one five minute long daydream a day. Uh, yeah, I think I did write books. I write about how um, I am a mighty daydreamer. Like when I was a little girl uh, in elementary school, all the comments on her report cards were like, oh, Natalie's doing fine. We like having her in class. She daydreams a little too much out the window. But I realized like that's how I'm wired. And it's actually, it's where all the good ideas get to, to marinate. So I encourage people, uh, use your smartphone device, set a timer, look out the window at the clouds. I'm from Philly, so we have a lot of front step culture. Go outside, sit on the, on the stoop, sit on the steps, and just like look at some blades of grass. Like you have to allow yourself to rest until that becomes a habit. And how do habits form? Habits need a feedback loop. There has to be a catalyst to start and then there has to be a reward. Mm -hmm. And for, more, for me, the reward of why I keep daydreaming is that I just feel refreshed. Mm -hmm. I feel like a little lighter and then I can go into the deeper work. So it's just a matter of, you just gotta create more wonder rituals and, and that, mm -hmm. will, that will counterbalance all the rigor. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. Like different system we design for ourselves. Um, one of my, uh, two of my friends, uh, Hori and Kathy, they're uh, three little kids and, um, okay, the older one is 13, not too little, but they're two That's little, little ones. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, they show me the board that they have created uh, during the pandemic for their kids. So each person has a board and they put on, you know, little heart stickers or stickers to kind of reward themselves when things get checked off. And somehow, as a grown up, I got to say that I remember a time where I was consulting and I would force myself to go swimming. I absolutely love swimming, but Me I too. always have so many excuses and I have time to do it because you have to travel to a place, shower, come back. And every time I did it, I gave myself a little flower because when I was in elementary school, oh. we always get like little flowers on our shirts. And we did something right. Um, oh. So I just put it on a board, like a white board, something that's visible. So at the end of the week, oh. like, wow, I treat myself. I took care of myself. Yeah. Taking care of yourself. Yeah, I love that. And as women, mm -hmm. it's so important. And especially um, as we get older, you know, I love that reward. Um, I, I, my two favorite physical activities are dancing and swimming. Mm -hmm. And I don't swim as regularly as I used to, but I used to swim when I was a professor. I used to swim like four mornings out of the work week, three minimum. Yeah. And I used yeah. to get up at 5 a.m., sometimes 5.15. I'd be in the pool by 6 a.m. Wow. so that I could shower and everything and, and, and be ready for work. And it was around that time that I was reading the work of people like Nir Eyal, actually yep. Nir wrote yeah, a nice right there. verse for my book, I love uh, Charles Duke. Love Nira's writing, Charles Duhigg, who also wrote about habits. And, and so when I was learning more about from, you know, Hooked and habits, I was like, why do I go, like, what is getting me out of the bed at that ungodly hour? <laughs> and I realized my reward, Faye, mm -hmm. uh, where I have, I love perfume. So I would have really sweet smelling shower gels and, and lotions. And so that was my reward that I was tricking my brain into like, um, every morning and not most mornings getting up and doing that swimming. So, so interesting how, how whatever we need to do to take care of ourselves, do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm glad you're bringing that up and I love how you're leaning over to the, the video. I love the frame of you on, on my screen. Oh, right good. So <laughs> chill, relaxed. And I, I think another thing I want to call out, like as a woman who's writing this book, I think another thing I want to call out as I'm in conversations with so many women with children between the age of, you know, five, six, all the way up to about college age. Uh, life happens so so fast. And I'm hearing a lot of women kind of reserving creativity only for their husbands and their children or other anyone else but themselves. Because um, I think it's a, there's a real situation going on and I'm not a mom, I, I love kids. And you know, you, you've done a lot of work creatively. You've taken a lot of roles, so you've traveled the world. And what is your, uh, some advice or some feedback or ways of thinking that 
women are now, you know, having these ungodly or like completely unrealistic hours and all the chores at home and a full-time job in America and, and everywhere else in the world. Like a lot of, they're going crazy. That's like so unfair, you know? Yeah. Like, well, balance with well, people. What's the joke that uh, more women need wives? <laughs> we, need, <laughs> yeah. we need wives to uh, to help us with um, it's the details, right? It's the details that we um, are more often than not left to take care of. Yeah, and um, I do think it has to do with choosing. Like, I'm not. I'm I'm 50 years old, so I've been around for a minute, and my i'm gen x so i'm actually the generation that the feminists got really pissed off at because it was my generation so the so the feminists of like the 60s and 70s that worked so hard for equity in the workforce and blah 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 and then my generation came along we're like yeah i know i have an mba or a phd or a master's degree at least college educated but I want to actually stay home with my kids now. I don't want to have to do both, right? So that caused a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. But my generation kind of said, well, but wasn't that the point of feminism for women to have a choice mm -hmm. so that I could choose if I wanted to try to balance out having children and working and all that comes with that or compartmentalize my life and say, this kind of, kind of be chapters. Um, so at this age and stage in my life, I am, I'm a big fan of, of like the work of, um, of, um, actually I have this book right here. I always forget how to say his last name, Greg McKeon, who's the author of Essentialism. Mm -hmm. But I really think there is something to having to make hard choices because otherwise we can be stretched too thin. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's just not, we won't be better to ourselves we won't be better for our children. We won't be better for our spouses. So we, we really, uh, you know, you, you need to choose and you have to ask for help, which is something that was really hard for me to do up until about, I think I'm still getting good at it. I think I started getting much better at like f only five years ago, but yeah. like you got to know how to ask for help. Like it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to not be great at everything and to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy Poehler said, no is a complete sentence, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, without having offering explanations and apologies and yep. To say no or not right now or I don't have the bandwidth and smile politely and it's, it's your truth and, and, and stick with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what a, such a pain point because I feel like a, you should probably feel okay to ask for help from a, from your husband or getting help from you know outside the house um it, it just i i do witness a lot of the you know inequality uh at home that women are expected oh yeah you know like oh yeah you're supposed to change the diapers i mean you're supposed to cook right like you're supposed to, cook, you're supposed to keep the kitchen clean keep the house clean yeah like i said um we don't get to have wives uh so it's it's also having conversations with our husbands, our spouses, and, and uh, kind of just being transparent about expectations and, and being honest. Yeah, absolutely. It's been such a pleasure, Natalie. I'm so glad to chat with you about your oh, book. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Really happy to, to be at this moment. I'm really grateful to you sharing your platform. And, um, and I know we're going to continue working together. You are a real joy to work together with. And like, like you said, shout out to Stephen Shapiro, who, who first connected us. And um, yeah, let's, 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 just, let's just see if we can keep encouraging people to make creativity leaps. Um, because um, our health depends on it. Um, our organizations depend on it. Our, our families depend on it. And it's actually how we are hardwired you know we're suppressing that it's mm -hmm. not something that only artists get to do it's Absolutely. something that all of us can exercise i love that message and i think it's such an opportunity now during the pandemic you know depending on where you are in this in the states or you know outside of the u.s you know take an opportunity to read a book uh that you have not read before or a new concept a, a new uh mindset shift and connect with people on Zoom 15, 20 minutes at the time, making connections, make introductions, and then 
yes. commit to you know meeting new people because i personally do not believe in you know friendship and collaboration simply by proximity get out of your comfort zone your original network maybe that network no longer serves, serves you anymore you know that's right branch out yeah that's right yeah, this is the, you're right. This is the opportunity and the time. We have the digital platforms to do it. We have the technology to do it. And frankly, this new constraint means we can totally extend beyond our comfort zone mm -hmm. and watch really amazing shifts happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for your book, your Thank you. work. Um, so can we do have you back? Thank you, Faye. Thank you, my sister. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.